What a week. Good morning. And welcome to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV Big Fox. I am your host, Frank Akam, and we are broadcasting live and proudly from the Hesselson studio here on Market Street in Corning. And what a show we have in store for you today. Not only will we be talking about Kamala Harris's speech last night in the DNC in general. We also have guests from Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. And that's Elmira Little Theater. Putting that on tonight is opening night. So we're going to talk with them. And in the 7 o'clock hour, fan favorite because it's Phil Friday, Assemblyman Phil Palmasano. We're going to ask him what he thought about the DNC as well. But most importantly, it's about what you thought of the DNC. Were you as disappointed as every American apparently if you watched any news this morning, which is Beyonce was a no-show. Yesterday, um, somewhat in the evening, I remember going to some of the websites I check, and it was Beyonce's confirmed. She's going to be there. Beyonce's going to perform. Exclamation marks. And I don't know, was it a ruse to get people to tune in right till the end? To watch the speech, there could be, if you want to be conspiratorial, there could be a point there because Beyonce did not show. But I want to hear from you. I Listen, the whole celebrity thing doesn't impress me, but I'm the outlier. Uh, It seems as if, actually, I would say, well, a little bit of news I watched this morning getting ready for work. The news story was more Beyonce didn't show than it was what Harris had to say. But again, that was just a quick little snippet that I was watching this morning. So what were your thoughts? First, this comment I received yesterday after the program, and I thought it was a very good point. And it was actually, um, I just missed reading it on the program because it was right before we went to, to our end break. This is what a viewer had to say. Well, I'm tired of hearing my wife complain about the high prices at the market. And please forgive me for having my air conditioning on last month when they tell me the elderly need to stay inside when it's hot outside. Do you think it'll get better with a Democratic agenda? I've worked my butt off all my life not to be poor, but I think that's what Harris and Walls want to do to control us. Thank you very much. We have other comments coming in that we'll be getting to. One thing I want to mention, because we will be talking to Phil, obviously about state issues. We will talk to a little bit about the DNC. Um, as well, but if you watch the DNC, I don't want you to say, well, Frank's talking with Phil, he won't mention it. Any comments that we get at the end, I'm going to try to read or maybe sprinkle them in throughout the interview to um, just kind of reiterate what you thought of last night's DNC. The anti Israel agitators were there to protest Harris's nomination. They said the Democrats are funding a genocide. One protester over a bullhorn said, as they officially nominate killer Kamala as the head of the stake, we are out here to say that nothing they say or do at the, in this convention will wash the blood of Palestinian men, women, and children off their hands. Some screaming into the bullhorn, long live the anti- Antifada, excuse me. Uh, So that was a trend throughout the whole week, though not reported on as much as maybe originally thought. Uh, They didn't want that narrative. Uh, Of course, there's a lot of concern yesterday, and this seems to have died down in the media as well, that they did not allow the uncommitted group to speak at the convention. And AOC was standing with the uncommitted saying it is wrong. They should have their voices heard, but not much more said about that. Jill Stein was there the whole week as well out in the protests. Jill Stein, if you're not familiar, she's the Green Party candidate for president. She said on Thursday that Democrats, quote, absolutely cheat and change the rules to maintain their grip on power. She was responding to a quote from Michelle Obama's speech where she said, we don't cheat others to get ahead. We don't get to change the rules, so we always win. Stein said, stop the gaslighting. Right now, the Democrats are trying to sue us off multiple state ballots, hiring spies and infiltrators to sabotage us, and even withholding public funds we qualified for months ago. Democrats absolutely cheat 
and change the rules to maintain their grip on power. Uh, Jill Stein making some waves this week. Well, if you go to the right outlets. Now, again, we're going quick this morning. So buckle in. I warned you yesterday right from the jump. We're going to cover as much as we possibly can. Uh, again, the big story and not something I would typically talk about, uh, but worth mentioning the outrage by many in the public that probably didn't want to turn in and watch the DNC or tune in to, to watch the DNC last night. But they heard Beyonce was going to perform. And it was from reputable sources. I mean, it was coming from everywhere. I, I one person from MSNBC and, and I'll, I'll get to it later. I, I don't remember uh, their name uh, saying specifically, I heard that Beyonce is now on the grounds. She's here. I have sources that said she has just arrived. <laughs> but one of the uh, quote unquote celebrities was the chicks. Now you may remember them as the Dixie chicks, but they distanced themselves from Dixie because of uh, the implications. So now they're called the chicks. Uh, in the past, they were they were controversial when they went on foreign soil and said that they were ashamed of George W. Bush when he was in office. So no surprise that they would be performing uh, at the DNC, but they were ripped for their awful, quote unquote, awful Star Spangled Banner performance at the DNC. I will fully admit that I missed it. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on the Star Spangled Banner rendition by the Chicks. One Twitter user said, the Chicks butchered the national anthem. It was terrible. That was just terrible. I mean, absolutely terrible rendition. Another Twitter using, uh, user saying the big act was the chicks who managed to mangle the national anthem with an embarrassing off-key rendition. It was that awful rendition of the national anthem by the chicks. Was that the big surprise of the night? The washed-up Dixie chicks? <laughs> you think they would have learned to stay out of politics, said another social media commentator. Uh, so that was kind of, we're just going through the beginning stages of this, setting the scene for what happened last night. It is being reported that Beyonce was never scheduled to perform at the DNC. That's what her representative said. Now, originally, yes, so you may have seen the reporting. Uh, if you're like me, just randomly check a couple of uh, trusted news sources uh, throughout the day. And TMZ, which is not a source that I check, but uh, others had cited, TMZ said, as you'd expect, Beyonce's appearance is a huge deal. Not only for Harris and the party, but in Chicago as well. We told Chicago PD is on high alert as it's involved in security for Beyonce at the United Center Arena. We don't know what she'll be performing, but the smart money is on freedom. Must be one of her big songs. And it's been the Harris Walls campaign anthem. There have been rumors all week that either Beyonce or Taylor Swift would show up in Chicago before the DNC ended. In fact, there are dozens of delegates in the arena tonight dressed in Cowboy Carter-styled outfits just in case Beyonce were to come through. Then a few hours later, this coming from the Hollywood Reporter. A representative for Beyonce says the singer will not attend the 2024 Democratic National Convention. Beyonce was never scheduled to be there, the Hollywood Reporter stated. The report of a performance is untrue. So many, many outraged and I don't want to talk any more about this, but th there is political implications to this. And uh, what I mean is they said that so many people could be persuaded, specifically Generation Z, if she were to perform or to endorse. Same with Taylor Swift. And they said that they could swing a lot of Gen Z voters to vote either for or against because of that endorsement. So a lot of people, because Beyonce is very popular, a lot of people tuning in to watch the DNC just to see her performance. So imagine when you feel slighted and angry at that and potentially angry at the DNC, the Democratic National uh, Committee, for perhaps uh, perpetrating that lie. You may feel betrayed and maybe justifiably so. Uh, so that does have political implications where people uh, could be outraged enough to tune out, to not vote, because that's sadly the state of celebrity in this country. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but I do find it very, very interesting. And I and I will admit, when I first saw that it was reported that she was going to perform, I said, uh-oh, that's going to be the whole story. It's going to be how historic it was. 
Uh, so to have her be a no-show, kind of fascinating. Now, some of the performers uh, throughout the week, Jason Isbell, Mickey Guyton, Patti LaBelle, Common, John Legend. So they had performer Stevie Wonder, of course. They had performers, but not the one they dreamt of. Some Twitter users saying, hearing that Beyonce has arrived at the United Center. That's what MSNBC's Katie Fang exclaimed hours before the giant letdown. Um, hearing a lot of, but where is Beyonce? As people left the DNC, said one conservative blogger. Katie Pavlik. There's another crowd protesting and chanting, where is Beyonce? These are all from on the ground at DNC Twitter users. After watching the DNC and hearing Kamala Harris speak, my thoughts are, where was Beyonce? Democrats said Beyonce and or Taylor Swift would be at the DNC. Disappointing conclusion after being teased with promises of quality entertainment. Hashtag fail. Another user saying, boy, that was fast. They went from joy to the world to lying about Beyonce. But then again, lying is what they do. Another user, and this I swear I'm almost done with this. You need to lie about Beyonce to get people to watch this, we'll say, garbage. A lot of people calling the DNC liars this morning. All right, we're going to get to the actual nitty-gritty, the actual politics, though I do believe that has political implications, though you may laugh at that. Uh, I would ask you to trust me on this one, uh, the power of celebrity, sadly, when it comes to influencing voters. But let's take our first break because we got a lot to cover this morning. We're going to hear from Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber Fleet, Fleet Street cast members from Elmira Little Theater a little bit later on, and then Assemblyman Phil Palmasano. So get your comments in. I'm going to read as many of the comments as I possibly can, and uh, you can, of course, get questions in for Phil as well. So stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV, Big Fox. And we are back broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio. And yes, folks, the moment you've all been waiting for, Ken has sent in our official, frankly speaking, uh, an analyst, commentator. He made it. People have been wondering. He made it and has watched all four nights of the DNC for us. And we are, and this is a really bad media tactic, but I'm going to do it anyway, and I apologize. I'm going to try to keep you hooked. We're going to read Ken's comments a little bit later on. He has been the official commentator of the DNC this whole time, and we all look forward to hearing what he has to say. So you're going to have to stay with us a little bit longer. And, yes, I'm sorry, but that's Media 101. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for helping me <laughs> keep people hooked. We are going to read it. Uh, the takeaways. Yes, CNN has their takeaways. So many other outlets have their takeaways. But I can, I can proudly say we have had the best takeaways this whole week on Frankly Speaking. But I do have some other comments to get to. One viewer said that watched the J.D. Vance movie on Netflix last night. Very moving. I have heard that. I have not watched uh, Hillbilly uh, Elegy. Excuse me. Um, I actually, um, one of my coworkers got me the book. And I plan on reading that. It's just been, obviously, a busy couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm going to start with the book and then watch the Netflix movie. So uh, thank you for that. Another comment from a different viewer. Watched most of the DNC last night in search of some of the, quote, joy that they always talk about. My search for joy, futile in my view, kind of like Bigfoot. Or Loch Ness Monster, yes. <laughs> Always hoping that, that that one extra documentary you watch will finally have the Bigfoot of the Loch Ness. So I understand what you're saying. I found her speech flat, off-putting, repetitive, void of any policy, just Trump bashing and twisted statements, in my opinion, that were flat-out lies. I'm glad it's over. That's my joy. <laughs> I've got to agree. It'd be nice to catch up on some sleep, and I'm sure Ken feels the same way. We'll have Ken's comments in just a moment. I thought you might like this from uh, Douglas Murray. Before we get into kind of the nitty gritty of yesterday, I would ask you, and I know Ken weighed in on it, Adam Kissinger, what do you think of him? Uh, talk, what is it about, let's take a step before I get to this Douglas Murray argument. What is it about Republicans that we're, that, that, that they're so good at being turncoats? 
I was trying to think this morning because I had someone text me that uh, who, who, trust me, does not like Trump or um, and is very much now a Harris supporter. And they said, I think Adam Kissinger did a good job on this uh, on the speech. And that's fine. Of course, you would. I mean, if you if you don't like Trump. Uh, but I was trying to think when when what Democrat can you point to? That became a star because they turned on their party. I think the only one you could say that was effective in it and actually got some attention, though mostly negative attention, was Tulsi Gabbard. And I, I don't know if she's still technically registered Democrat or maybe it's independent. I, I don't think she's a, a full-blooded Republican by any means. But Tulsi Gabbard does a great job. She actually, if you want to go back to debates with Kamala Harris, uh, Kamala Harris had one good debate. Uh, we got regular friends walking by. Um, if you go back to the debate back in uh, 2019, and Kamala, as you know how primaries work, you're trying to get one point from this person, one point from this person, just keep building momentum. And she had that huge line. Kamala Harris, where she called her now boss, the current president of the United States, uh, a bigot. And it, she became a star overnight. And she took some points from people. Took, and she never realized that in the next debate, there'd be people gunning for her because they wanted the points that she just gained. So she thought she was riding that momentum if she only knew, she just had to wait it out and could just be handed the nomination. But anyway, uh, she didn't realize that people were going to be going after her. And Tulsi Gabbard destroyed her in that debate. Now, the media, though, in that scenario, does not praise Tulsi Gabbard. They do not uh, prop her up and interview her as much as possible as they do with Republicans when they turn on their party. They actually tried to destroy Tulsi Gabbard. So... If you want to make money, you want to be popular, because maybe you were never popular in your life. If you want to be on the CNNs and the MSNBCs, et cetera, all it takes is for you to be a Republican, have no spine, have no true core beliefs, and turn on your party and badmouth your party, i.e. Chris Christie, and you will get that attention. And that's exactly what Adam Kissinger did. Now, why did I go into all that? Because it just... I was trying to think this morning. Tulsi Gabbard is the only example that I can think of that got even a little bit of attention. Can you think of somebody? But we could name, I mean, really, if you want to go through and name the Republicans who turned on them uh, on other Republicans, I don't think we have time in the show. Romney, McCain, and McCain learned the hard way that just because you badmouth your own party the whole time, uh, the media is still going to turn on you when you get that uh, nomination. But we can continue. Chris Christie, as I mentioned, Liz Cheney, the list goes on and on. And they are any one of them at any moment could be given a prime interview spot on one of the news programs. Because as long as you are Republican, the bad, uh, quote unquote Republican, the bad mouths Republicans, you will always be praised by the media until you get too much power. Uh, so we are going to read Ken's. Uh, takeaways from last night in a, just a moment. Let me take this break. We're going to go to uh, Douglas Murray's article, then a break probably, and then we'll read Ken's comments. So stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. And we are back. Broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio, we're going to get to Ken's takeaways. He's been with us all week telling us what his thoughts on the DNC, and he made it through night four. So thank you, Ken. Uh, we're going to get to those in just a moment. And yes, I am being a jerk and keeping you hooked. Uh, Douglas Murray looked at the week of the Democratic National Convention, and he presents it in a Oscars format. He said, with a host of A-list celebrities and B-list politicians, it felt almost like the Oscars. So here we go. Best Actress, Nancy Pelosi. There really was no competition in this category. Nancy Pelosi gave the performance of a lifetime. Reading every one of her lines without cracking. We will not soon forget the way in which she said that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris 
had, quote, established one of the most successful presidencies of modern times. And then put such emotion into her voice while talking about infrastructure on rural broadband. But the standout moment was her tribute to Joe Biden. Only a few weeks ago, Pelosi went to see Joe and brutally ended his career, reportedly telling him that he must either stop his run or get pushed out, quote, the hard way. This week was always going to be a mountain for Nancy to climb, but she managed it. Her performance was second to none as she paid tribute to the man whose career she so recently ended. She emoted, she praised, she licked her lips. And during Biden's own performance, she could be seen enthusiastically waving a We Love Joe banner. It takes an actor of once in a generation skill to do what Nancy did. Then best supporting actress, Hillary Clinton, the former first lady, is a master at the supporting role. So it was inevitable that there would be artistry in her performance. And so it proved. Who could fail to be impressed when she talked about the glass ceiling that she and Kamala had done so much to crack? Or the way in which she held a smile, even as she said that Kamala would, should be the first woman to make it to the Oval Office. Some viewers may have got the feeling that Hillary was about to grab a bigger trophy and burst out screaming, it should have been mine at any moment, but she didn't. She kept herself measured and turned in a performance of rare, multi-layered complexity, underscored by a raw rage. <laughs> Best actor, Bill Clinton, the boy from Arkansas, took the stage for half an hour to remind people of the good old days, by which we mean the days of George Washington. Without bursting out laughing once, Bill Clinton compared Joe Biden to George Washington and said that like Washington, Biden had exited the stage at a time of his own choosing. Historians are still looking for the Chuck Schumer, Barack Obama, and George Clooney characters of 1797. Best Supporting Actor, Cardinal Kupik. I'm not sure, sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right. Kupik deserves a mention for his hilarious performance as a Catholic cardinal. Leading a prayer on stage, he praised the idea of Americans being united by profound aspirations of life. The cardinal had clearly not toured the abortion of vasectomy trucks, which were doing big business outside the convention, nor the huge 20-foot inflatable IUD that was also hovering around. Then you have Lifetime Achievement Award, Oprah Winfrey. Though she has long been promised to attend, this was Oprah Winfrey's first time at the ceremony, so she deserves this Lifetime Achievement Award, not least for her inspiring claim that she understood because she had suffered from income inequality. She only forgot to say which side she had seen it from. Best animated feature, Joe Biden. It is amazing what modern animation can achieve. Way past his normal bedtime of 4 p.m., a character amazingly resembling Joe Biden took the stage. He managed a whole speech, whipped himself up into a rage over things that nobody said, and wiped a tear from his face as he accepted the gratitude of a party that wanted him gone. There was reported to be a sequel to his animation in the works, but word is that the studio pulled the plug after a poor performance at the box office. Best picture, Teresa Warman. The folks behind the ca camera often fail to get the recognition they deserve, so hats off to the cameraman and editor for their cutaway to Teresa Warman on Wednesday. Have you heard about this, by the way? You, you got to feel for this Teresa Warman. I'm not sure who she is. Uh, she's a delegate from Maryland. But as um, a speech was going on, oh, it was an Oprah speech. And Oprah says uh, something like a shout out to all the childless. <laughs> kind of laughing thinking about this video because I watched it yesterday. Uh, to all those childless cat ladies. And for some, <laughs> I'm going to start giggling. <laughs> For some reason, the camera cuts over to, to this poor lady just sitting there trying to have fun at the DNC. Watch the video. It's worth it. I mean, I, I feel bad for her. Warman soon became aware <laughs> that she had chosen as the face of childless Catwoman everywhere. But she had already nailed it and given the nation this year's best picture. Can't get it off my head. Anyway, enough about that. Oh, special effects. Sometimes it takes a whole team, says Douglas Murray. And the award for best special effects has to go to none other than Kamala Harris and her team of advisors. In a matter of weeks, they've managed to turn a hopeless candidate into a front runner. The first special effect was the claim that the crazy Kamala laugh was not embarrassing, but was in fact brat, whatever that is. That was a thing going on. Then we learned that all the word salads and wine mom mannerisms were in fact joy. 
Finally, we are being told that someone who has been vice president for the past four years was both in charge and not in charge, knows what to do but hasn't done it so far, and can both claim credit for the economy and yet insist that it needs fixing. In the process, the Democrats have managed to create a whole new candidate, not the Kamala we thought we knew, but a new special Kamala who we apparently don't know at all, a Kamala who is hyper-competent, super inspiring and a fresh face in politics it rivals avatar the matrix and star wars as one of the greatest special effects achievements of all time and deserves the top prize there we go i just thought that was a unique way of looking at it and recapping the whole week uh when we come back as promised we are going to hear from ken who has been our i'm going to still say correspondent i like that term even though he's not on the ground but correspondent because he has watched with steel reserve not the alcohol drink. <laughs> um, well, maybe. Uh, the whole four days of the DNC, and he has recapped it for us each day, and we will have his final look back at night four of the DNC when we come back. Stay with us. Also, we have guests from the Myra Little Theater coming up, and, of course, Assemblyman Phil Palmasano. I'm going to stop trying to giggle here over that picture in my mind of that. you got to look it up, folks. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV. Big Fox, stay with us. And we are back with Frankly Speaking. We're having a blast this morning. I'm so glad that you joined us as we broadcast live from the Hesselson studio. Coming up in just a moment, we will hear from Elmira Little Theater because tonight they open Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street at the Clemens Center. So we're going to hear from Alice Williams, who plays Sweeney, and Heather Haskins, who plays Miss Lovett. So that's coming up in a little bit. And, of course, Assemblyman Phil Palmasano. Uh, so it's only fair that we get to Ken's uh, takeaways, and I, I've kept you hanging long enough. But before that, a couple comments from viewers. Good morning, Frank. Good morning. I forced myself to watch Kamala last night. Absolutely nothing substantive in her speech. No policies were discussed. Nothing of value for the American voter. Truly sad to see Adam Kissinger attack Trump and his performance while claiming conservative values is abhorrent. While he claims, meaning Adam Kissinger claims conservative values, it's abhorrent. Yeah, it, it, but aren't you used to it? I hate to say that. But what, I'm not knocking what you're saying at all. But aren't we, like Republicans, listen, Democrats are fine with not being able to vote, uh, knowing that the system is always rigged and that the elites get to pick because they're used to it. I mean, go back to Bernie. Now we see this year uh, Harris getting the nomination without ever receiving a single vote. The man who spoke day one received the votes and he is not running for re-election because he was pushed out. They, they must be used to it. Republicans, I think you just gotta get used to the fact that the turncoats are going to get the most attention, get that national stage. As I said, we could spend the whole show, I, the easy ones are you know Romney, Chris Christie, Adam Kissinger, Liz Cheney. Um, we can go on and on. Uh, throughout history, McCain, it's kind of sadly what Republicans do. And I don't know if it's because they want to be liked by the quote unquote cool kids because they weren't popular. I don't know if it's because they want that speaking spot at the DNC. Keep in mind with Adam Kissinger, by the way, the Democrats redistrict his district and it cost him his job that and his bashing of Trump. It cost him his job and that there he is stooping and bowing to the Democrats and endorsing Kamala Harris. But thank you for that point. Uh, okay, and here, Ken, as we get ready to read Ken's takeaways, we have a question for Ken this morning from a viewer. My question to Ken would be, after watching so much of, of the rally, of, of the DNC, does he feel dirty? That's a fair question. After watching so much, all four days, do you feel dirty? Maybe he needs an emergency trip to a Trump rally. All right, here we go. Ken's takeaways. Ken has been kind enough to be our pundit here on Frankly Speaking and staying up each night to watch the DNC. Here we go. I made it through night four of the DNC. I'm still a little shaky from the no-dose and caffeine. This has been a long week for you, Ken. I think my wife left me <laughs> and the cat is attacking an effigy of the orange man. <laughs> when thinking about if it was worth it, I keep going back to the fact that at 70 years old, I wasted the last four days and will never get them back. That's a good point. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, it was more of the same. Demonized Trump and the Republicans praised Kamala and the Democrats. One of the biggest arrows in the Dems' quiver 
is the fact that if you say a lie enough times, it will eventually become the truth to people that aren't critical thinkers. Absolutely. Also, they have the media to uh, amplify and echo. And we can't, we can't take the importance of that away. But here we go. Elizabeth Warren did her job to keep up the Democrats' dishonest talking points. I wonder how much money she made as a professor at Harvard by lying about her Indian heritage and what actual ethnicity didn't get hired because she lied. Uh, amazing point. I see that she broke down and cried as well. I mean, that that is a huge point. You're exactly right. It's not just the fact that she cheated the system. It's about who suffered because she cheated the system. Great point. Al Sharpton did what he does best. Lied about Trump. Like the fine people on both sides lie. Everything he preaches about is racially charged. I wonder if anyone is ever going to take him to task for still not paying his taxes. And that has been a common refrain about him not paying his taxes for how long, Ken? I mean, as long as I've been in this business. And it's true. Anyway, I don't just mean in TV and media. Next up, the gun violence stories were incredibly heart-wrenching. I agree with common sense gun control, but not outlawing commonly used guns, lying about them being weapons of war, government confiscation, or red flag laws that don't have penalties for the accusers if they knowingly make a wrongful accusation. And I wonder why they won't consider hardening our schools. Exactly. Next up, Leon Panetta should be ashamed of himself for the lies he told about Trump and saying Trump didn't respect our troops. Trump never checked his watch when receiving our fallen troops back on American soil, exactly just like Joe Biden did after the disastrous and, and heartbreaking Afghanistan withdrawal that, as we mentioned yesterday in the program, uh, really was the beginning of, of Ukraine, uh, Russia going into Ukraine, Hamas attacking Israel, the weakness that we are showing across the world, Russia, China, Iran, uh, realizing they now have uh, a power and making moves. So, yes, very good point. Next up, and if you're just joining us, this is Ken's Takeaways. Gretchen Whitmer parroted the rest of the Democrat lies. Did you see that CNN, um, I don't know if it was on other outlets, but I see that the CNN feed went uh, dark for two minutes of uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer's speech. As someone has stated, someone's getting fired. Yes, <laughs> that two minutes. Why did it black out? Went to MSNBC to watch instead, said one commentator. Yeah, not good for CNN. Continue with what Ken had to say. Adam Kissinger, one of the biggest Republican turncoats, took great pleasure in demonizing Trump and the Republicans while praising Kamala and the Democrats. If the Republicans don't chastise him for his actions, they deserve to lose elections and not being able to govern one in the majority. Yeah, Adam Kissinger has been... Listen, there's always going to be Republicans like it. It's frustrating. Uh, but keep in mind, he backed Kamala after Democrats redrew his district, costing him his job, ending his career. But, yeah, he'll be on MSNBC and CNN. He'll get that attention. Next up, this is what Ken had to say about Kamala. Kamala was effectively able to condense all the lies about Trump that we heard over the past four days into one 50-minute speech that she read very well. She was compassionate, stern, concerned, and angry at all the right times, depending on the text she was reading. She stated multiple times that we need to go forward and not backwards, apparently ignoring the wonderful things the Biden-Harris administration had done in the past three and a half years. Yeah, exactly. Going back to what Scott, Settings, uh, Scott Jennings said, Democrats have had control of the White House for 12 of the last 16 years. So what's this going, not going back? I mean, she has been there three and a half years, and that's exactly what Trump said uh, in his post on it. Why haven't you done these things then? If you have all the answers, why have you been sitting on it for three and a half years? Continuing with what Ken had to say, I couldn't help but think during her speech that she is a self-confirmed liar. When she was asked why she would work for the man she called a racist, she laughed and said it was a debate, which obviously meant that she was willing to lie about anything to get her desired results. Why would, well, maybe she wasn't lying. Maybe she, I know she said it was a debate, but maybe she does think he, uh, he's a bigot. Why would her tactics be any different during her run for the presidency now? Right, ever-changing, doing quote-unquote U-turns when it's convenient. Couldn't agree more. One indisputable fact is that Kamala is making history, not for being the first Indian black woman to run for president, but for being a candidate for the presidency without earning one vote from her constituents. Yeah, that's what I mean. I, I know Hillary talked about breaking the glass ceiling, but is that the way you want to do it with kind of a essentially an asterisk 
where she was never supported by the Democrat voters f- to get that nomination? I-, I don't know. That's I think that's a fair question. I pose that to anybody that's watching, Democrat or Republican, uh, man or woman. Doesn't it seem weird? It is history making, but doesn't it seem weird that it's always going to have that asterisk by her name that she did not actually earn the nomination? She was just given the nomination. Continuing again with what Ken had to say because I'm running late. Kamala comes with a lot of radical baggage and Walls is using his words weird. I still think there's another surprise waiting in the Democrats' wings. I wonder why one of the most liberal and charismatic darlings of the Democrat Party was not put on stage to recant Kamala's virtues. Gavin Newsom. Yeah, Gavin Newsom. Interesting. He can't be happy uh, how this all went down, but I think he's a good soldier. He'll probably play along. Ken a big gratitude from me and from all the viewers for staying up the last four days and watching this and being our analyst for the DNC. We appreciate it. So thank you very much. We've got other comments coming in, but we got to take a short break. Stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV. Big Fox, stay with us. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Aiken. We are broadcasting from the Hasselson Studio, and this is the Stu Ben Senior Services Fund section of our program. And we are being joined by some of the cast of Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Thanks so much for being on the show this morning. Thanks hey, for thanks. having us. This is opening night. Are you nervous? Not yet. No. Uh, <laughs> are you ready? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Anxious, you know. Want to get in front of an audience. Yes, can't wait. How long have you guys been preparing? We auditioned back in May, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we've been rehearsing ever since then. Um, Yeah. What's a typical, how many times do you practice a week? I know something like this takes a lot of dedication, right? It does. It does. Juggling summer schedules because everybody's doing everything all the time. We try to get together three to four times a week until we get closer to the show, and then we'll book it up to every night. Do you ever get bored of the play that you're doing? Not, Not this, this one. one. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you plan that? No. Uh, uh, that's what I find kind of fascinating because it seems like anything else, if you watch a TV show or something over and over again, the same one, you're going to get kind of bored. But you have to know the characters you're playing, right? It's a really great – anytime you do a show, you get a really great experience of creating and finding, like, yourself within a character. And then just – it's it's like when you're three or four years old and you play house and you decide to be, like – this whole different person than who you are. Hmm. It's just so much fun. How do you specifically get into character? Like when you open tonight, how do you go from who you are sitting here right now to the character you're playing, which is Sweeney and Miss Lovett? Yeah, that's a good question. (laughs) Yeah, you don't know yet. It doesn't, well, no, for me, I I like, uh, I tend to feel it a little more when I get into the setting of the stage. Okay. When I get into that stage setting, then I feel as though I can, you know, maybe depending on my line delivery, maybe there'll be a little chill or a little something where sure. I'm really putting, trying to put myself into Sweeney's mindset. And then, and then from there, once I'm in, then I feel like, okay, let's go. That kind of puts you in a dark place then, doesn't it? Oh my gosh. <laughs> dark, dark, yeah. darker, darkest, yeah. still dark. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is a dark one. Yeah. It's great. It's like funny and there's bright spots, but there's definitely a lot of that darkness and dark humor yeah. and, it's so much fun. That's you, where Heather's character really brings to life a lot of the humor. Yeah. How do you get into character? Um, makeup, hair, costume, that's all a huge okay. a huge development part of it. But then it's as soon as you hear the music and you start to jump into it, it just it just happens. So I've never thought about that. How long does the, the hair and makeup and, and those type of things, when you're getting ready, how long does that take? Depending on your character, um, mm-hmm. it can take anywhere from 10 minutes to half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, There's a lot of special effects makeup in this one. Um, So we actually have some of the team from Texylvania that comes in to do some of our blood work and our things like that. Yeah, it's cool. And you mentioned it is a dark uh, play, but it also has moments of kind of lightness. Do you think that's what's made it so popular through the years? Because this is one that even someone like me that doesn't go to the theater that much knows a lot about Sweeney Todd. I think so. I know Mm -hmm. within the theater community, Stephen Sondheim, who wrote the... The, the musical is a huge, huge inspiration for a lot of us. Um, so it's it's kind of got that beautiful following of thespians and actors and singers. Um, but because it's so popular mm. and there's there's the movie with Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter, oh. that it opened it up more to the masses. So it's really, it's really out there and available more than some other shows that are available. And there's a good balance, I think. I think the way it's written, a, a lot of the dialogue, there are really some 
foreshadowing that if you're really like it's one of those things where you can go back and see it again and like the more that you know I look at the, at the lines and such the more I can really appreciate even sure. the little innuendos and then there's such a nice balance between the really dark side and believe it or not, the comedic side. So I, I think there's a lot of things that drive it to make it popular. Now, you mentioned the movie, which I guess I kind of forgot about the movie. Is that something that you watch in preparation or try to avoid in preparation? Everybody's different. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. different. And you'll find when you speak to different people how they prepare. Some people will refuse to watch anything. Yeah. Some people watch, will watch everything that they can yeah. find to like steal little snippets of ideas. Um, I kind of do both. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I tend to... I, I try to find not to steal things but to see oh well, that's an interesting way of approaching or well there's 180 degrees out from that approach you know it's nice to just kind of see those different ideas that then mm -hmm. try put something together now how long because you mentioned other places getting in the character how long have you been involved in acting and also how long have you been involved with Elmira Little Theater me first on that yeah. <laughs> my very first one with Elmira Little Theater oh that's great yeah so I relocated to this area uh, last year okay. <laughs> so um, prior to that I don't know, you know, 30 years worth of acting. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I've been doing it for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the opposite. Okay. I grew up with Elmira Little Theater. My mom was a big performer in the in the organization, and I grew up playing around the costume shop and things like yeah. that. So I've been involved ever since I can remember in Elmira Little Theater, and I've been yeah. just, like, rocking and rolling ever since. And we've talked in the past with uh, members of Elmira Little Theater, but if someone's interested in becoming involved, what's the best way to join Elmira Little Theater? Because I know it may not just be acting. There's so many other parts to this that go into a, success, a successful play. Absolutely. You can always, if you want to be on stage, they're always having auditions. Um, they are all over Facebook when they post their auditions. They do that there. And they also do their website, elmiralittletheater.org. Okay. Um, and you can also reach out to them through that website if you want to work backstage doing tech, if you want to do sound, lights, um, sure. anything like that as well. Uh, we're talking about Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Now, this kind of shows my ignorance on this. Is this considered a play? Because I've been using the term play, or is it considered a musical? Or neither. I don't know how that works. Well, some people have called it an operetta because there's so much Just of the dialogue that's, yes. <laughs> that's that's sung. So, I wasn't so even uh, yeah, I would consider it in or more modern terms a musical. Okay. Yeah. Is the music part difficult? Would you rather have a play that you're in where you don't have all this music? I love the music. Oh, okay. Yeah. I love it. Yes, it is very difficult. Okay. This right. is one of the more difficult plays that I've ever been a part of. Um, but I love a good musical. Okay. I, love, I love the challenge of it. Mm -hmm. uh, this this particular Soundheim has a lot of, I'll say from a musical perspective, dissonance in it, okay. which at times can be difficult to, you know, enact and, and send out there properly. But that the challenge of that and the challenge of the different emotions throughout it, oh, I just love it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. it seems stressful to to remember the lyrics because think about when you're in your car and you're singing a song you think you know and you still screw it up. Is that right? Right. Oh, so every time. So you have to. Uh, so <laughs> Is you, he trying to put pressure on? No, I didn't, mean, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't do that. Uh, but I'm just thinking. And while you're trying to remember the lyrics, you also have to act. That's so many more levels to it. I don't. I I'm, didn't mean to make you stress. Okay. No, you're not. How that many? How many people uh, are in the cast? Because I've seen pictures and there's quite a few people. Yeah. We have between 50 and 60 people in the cast wow. on stage, and it ranges, the cool part is that it ranges from a nine-year-old up to oh. uh, folks in their 60s. So it's really, for for the community show, we've encompassed a lot of the decades. <laughs> it's really neat seeing all the generations yeah. up there. Now, it's different because the nine-year-old's acting, obviously, but is this a play that you would maybe avoid with kids, or is it... I don't want to it, discourage people. Yeah, we well, we have it. Uh, it's rated uh, on our marketing stuff as PG thirteen. Okay, yeah. and I think that that's appropriate because there are some definite adult themes mm -hmm. uh, that you wouldn't want to explain to a ten year old. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, today is opening night at Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street, and that's at Clement Center Powers Theater. Uh, you can find out more. You, we were talking about off the air. Where can you, you get tickets? Uh, you can call the Clement Center box office, and you can get tickets beforehand, or you can get them right at the door. And what are the dates and times just before we go? August 23, 24, and 25. There are two shows on Saturday the 24th, a 2 p.m. matinee, and then the one in the evening at 7.30, and the Sunday show is also a 2 p.m. show. Okay, so just before we go, this is kind of a corny question I always ask. So Sunday's the last performance at 2 p.m. What does your Monday look like when it's all over? <laughs> <laughs> coffee. Coffee, just lots of coffee? Coffee and 
I'll race a your whole memory. lot of not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you'll have the song stuck in your head for a long time after? Forever. Oh, yeah. yeah. Forever. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So, again, Get Tickets is going to be a really big, uh, um, of course, audience. And when you were saying you can get them at the door, but you would probably recommend getting them ahead of time, right? Always. Yeah. Yeah. Online is uh, clemenscenter.org, I okay. think, is a good way to uh, find it if you want to go online, too. All right. Well, enjoy. You worked hard for it. I hope everything goes smooth. And we'll talk next time Elmari Little Theaters in town. Ta- in town. They're always in town. But when they, <laughs> when they want to come on the show, okay? Awesome. Thanks Thank so you much. so much. All right. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV. Big Fox, stay with us. And we are back. Thank you to our friends, Alice Williams and Heather Haskins from Elmira Little Theater for being on the show this morning. Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street, opens tonight at the Clemens Center. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, by the way, since we have just a moment, we're going to read some comments here. Good luck to all of those playing in the Sheriff's Golf Tournament today. At the Bath Country Club. I know uh, some of you signed up. Uh, so good luck. Hit them straight. All right. couple comments from viewers. I feel a little bit of Trump per day gives me my daily dose of joy. Thank you very much. Another comment. Good morning, Frank. And we're going to count that. Good morning. The DNC convention was a total waste of time. The Democrat Party is about endorsing communism. Thank you very much. Keep those comments coming in. Uh, as I mentioned, Assemblyman Phil Pomisano will be our guest in the next hour. So make sure uh, that you get your questions in. But also, if you want to weigh in on the DNC, we will sprinkle them in uh, throughout our time with Phil. So don't think that you have to stay quiet on what you saw last night. Feel free to weigh in. So Kamala Harris has accepted the Democrat nomination for president last night. She calls it a new way forward. I guess that new way forward is to never receive a vote and just be handed the nomination. It's kind of an interesting. It is a new way forward. It's historic. Why not? Kind of makes it a lot easier, I would think. A lot of people on the street this morning. Taking the stage to a thunderous standing ovation. This is coming from the AP, by the way. As she closed out the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, the vice president argued that her personal story and background as a prosecutor made her uniquely qualified to protect America's interest against a former president she casts as only having his own interest in mind. So we had Ken's amazing takeaways all week. Let's see what CNN's takeaways were from yesterday. They had eight takeaways. Number one, Harris offers a return to pre-Trump normalcy. Well, isn't that what Biden ran on too? I'm, we're not going back, Harris said. We're not going back, apparently, to the last three and a half years. I, <laughs> it's such a weird... I mean, again, we know the media is not going to scrutinize it. We know they're not going to go after. So she can really say these things and not have any kind of implication uh, to, you know, with the media going after her is not going to affect her at all. So they're not like Scott Jennings. I know I keep quoting it, but like he said, Democrats have been in control of the White House for 12 of the last 16 years. So when they talk about not going back or they're going to make these changes, where have they been? the last three and a half years. Continuing, Harris gets personal. She told a personal story. Allies back up the Harris resume with some of the guest speakers. Uh, You got to meet the Harris clan, it says. Trump and many other Republicans for years have made a show out of mispronouncing Harris's first name. Harris's two young grandnieces went on stage to say how you pronounce it. Do they make a show out of it? I mean, I think there was just confusion from the beginning on how to say it. I mean, it's Kamala. I think most people say. Anyway, poignant moment from people affected by gun violence was a takeaway. The Central Park Five members said that Trump wanted them dead. The Gaza war opponents were denied a speaking spot by the DNC. Mm -hmm. That's a takeaway. And finally, celebrities make their mark. Well, I mean, I guess you had Oprah. You had some others, but obviously Beyonce was a big takeaway. And not from CNN, but in my opinion, the outrage that she did not show up. Harris took aim at Trump as she vows to be president. And it is seven o'clock and I'm running extremely late. Hour number two coming up after this. I apologize. We'll be right back. And we are back. It is our number two of Frankly Speaking. We have Assemblyman Phil Palmasano 
coming up in just a little bit. I want to go through some of the media coverage because it is as predicted that it was a historic speech, it was a moving speech, et cetera, et cetera. The first black woman to claim a major party nomination on Thursday styled her unlikely journey to the Democratic nod as a springboard to lift the country to a new place after years of being torn apart by its bitter divides. Why has this not been happening since day one? Anyway, the vice president, who no one thought would be the candidate even five weeks ago, offered voters a clear choice in a steady and patriotic Democratic National Convention address in Chicago. This coming from Stephen Collinson. He quotes Adriana Sourcefire, the executive director of Black Pack, a black-led advocacy organization, explaining that Harris was offering a chance for, quote, America to become its best self after years of discord. What are our aspirations? Who do we believe ourselves to be? How do we understand that the highest ideals of this country in terms of a multiracial democracy? It's been eight years of chaos, of destabilization, and Joe Biden becoming a transition point. It's been eight years of chaos, of destabilization. Trump was in there for four years. I'm confused. And I think that what we're seeing right now is that people are saying we can be better than the worst version of ourselves, which they attribute to the Trump campaign and the Republican Party. Harris leaves her convention with an exuberant. United Party behind her. Democrats are electrified by the metamorphosis of the ticket, backed by Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, who has become America's coach. Did you know, I didn't know this, and, and bear with me, this is just kind of one of those small political things. I found out yesterday that Walls in that championship team was a coach, but he was the assistant coach. Now, that might not mean anything to you. I just, I didn't know that. That's not something they presented. Just like, you know, kind of how there's been criticism of him, of him misstating his um, his rank in the National Guard. And I'm not saying he's misstating it. He's still a coach. But I, I didn't realize that he was an assistant coach. Take that for what it's worth. I'm just trying to give you some some facts. Okay. More on the media coverage. David Axelrod was on CNN. And he said, the last point I wanted, Scott, to your point about Biden and the strategy of the Republicans, which I understand it to be a reasonable strategy, is to try and saddle her with some of the negatives that Biden has. It is really interesting how little she mentioned Joe Biden in this speech. In certain ways, this was her declaration of independence, and she became her own person in this speech. And I've told you before, we'll see how it turns out. I think you're going to have a hard time saddling her in the way that you guys are hopeful that you can. Yeah, because the media is not going to run with the fact that she's been even vice president for three and a half years. That is going to almost be glanced over. So when she says stuff is going to happen on day one and she's going to fix this and fix that, they're not going to say, well, where has she been for the last three and a half years? It's going to be, it's transformative. It's amazing. MSNBC's Nicole Wallace said Kamala disqualified Trump from ever being the commander in, in chief. The speech is so many things. I think there was some incorrect analysis out there that she somehow had to pass the commander in chief test. She is the sitting vice president. The Wall Street Journal reported on her, the vital role she had in helping the hostage release. Big efforts from the Biden-Harris administration. I think what she did tonight was disqualify Donald Trump from ever being the country's commander in chief. Um, next up, Wow, Jake Tapper was just gushing. He said, Vice President Kamala Devi, is that how you say it? Harris, age 59. This is Jake Tapper. Daughter of Oakland, accepting her party's nomination. It was a speech that four weeks and five days ago she was not preparing to make. But as she said, she is no stranger to unlikely journeys. She shared with us her origin story as a prosecutor with her childhood friend, Wanda Kagan, who is here tonight being molested by her, uh, by her stepfather. She talked about representing the people, Kamala Harris for the people. She discussed how she would be a president for everyone and wanting to perform an opportunity, economy for the middle class. It was a speech of progressive politics and unifying rhetoric. A speech with many, many shots across the bow at Donald Trump, her opponent, and a speech in which she sought to portray herself as a credible commander in chief, patriotic, firm, confident, and credible. She discussed Israel and Palestine. She discussed Ukraine. She discussed the threat from Iran. It was a remarkable address, one that I've never seen her give quite like this before. A very, very powerful speech. You got to go back, I think, to Barack Obama in 2008 for a Democratic speech like this. Perhaps even a speech like this at all. 
I I don't want to pat myself on the back here. But I was pretty close these last few days and how the coverage was going to be, wasn't I? Uh, they may have uh, changed the wording a little bit, but I was pretty close. Uh, I was real close. But anyway, and you were too. You knew what was coming. It was going to be historic. It was going to be unifying. It was going to be a powerful speech, perhaps the most powerful speech ever given. It was the second coming of Barack Obama. We knew all of that. We've said it throughout the week. Go back to the tapes. So it comes as no surprise. Though it is interesting, Kristen Welker on MB and a on NBC, excuse me, had this to say. She said that Harris took immigration to Israel on head on. What was notable when she talked about her vision for the future, it sounds a lot like she plans to build on the Biden agenda. What this speech did was really fill in a lot of those blanks about her biography, growing up, being raised largely by her mom, painting a picture, again, that the theme of a strong mother as a figurehead that she had at the head of her table who inspired her to become the person who she is. What inspired her to become a prosecutor? All those details getting filled in. And then when she talked about that she plans to do for the country, she talked about things like cutting taxes for the middle class. She talked about things like voting rights, things that really matter to Democrats. But again, we didn't hear a whole lot about how she would be different from a Biden administration. Interesting. Admitting what we all know. Now, Trump blasted Harris on Truth Social. He said she didn't mention China. She didn't mention fracking. She didn't mention energy. She didn't mention meaningfully Russia and Ukraine. She didn't mention the big subjects of the day that are destroying our country. There are 60 million people in poverty in the U.S. under her watch, and she doesn't even talk about them. She's talking about how great San Francisco was before she destroyed it. Probably not a good idea. <laughs> no specific programs, all talk, no action. Why didn't she do it three and a half years ago, Trump asked. During the speech, Trump referred to Harris as a radical Marxist and said she stands for incompetence and weakness while the country is being laughed at all over the world. Harris called Trump an unserious man in her speech and said the consequences of putting Donald Trump back in the White House are extremely serious and how he would use the immense power of the presidency of the United States not to improve your life, not to strengthen your national security, but only to serve the only, to serve the only client he has ever had himself. So what were your thoughts of the DNC? Uh, I, as I said, I will be reading your comments throughout our interview with uh, Assemblyman Phil Palmisano, who's coming up in just a little bit. I think we have all of our housekeeping in order here. Yes, we do. Oh, I did learn one thing. I know I've been promoting all week, and, and I'm going to be promoting up until September 8th for the Salvation Army as um, they have that big barbecue fundraiser coming up on the 8th uh, with corn and catering. And just $15, we have tickets here. You can get them at Brown Cigar Store. You can stop over at the Salvation Army. I really hope that you'll be a part of it. But I also learned, and I know a lot of people like this, that we have a new way. Look at that. Scan that with your phone right now, and you can order tickets online for the Salvation Army fundraiser. As I continue to say, they are in need, folks. That does not mean they're not doing all the good that they normally do. Of course they are. They're such a, an important part to our community. It's just becoming a struggle. So we're ha holding this big fundraiser. And full disclosure, I am the chairman of the advisory board. Uh, but please help out. And they tell me these QR codes are really popular. So there you go. Please purchase some tickets. All right, we got to take our first break of hour number two. Something that Phil Palmasano will be joining us shortly. Stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking. As we broadcast live from the Hesselson studio, we'll be right back. We are back, frankly speaking, broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio. We've got some great comments coming in before we get to Assemblyman Phil Palmasano. First up, especially disturbing for me was all the talk that Donald Trump was all about himself. If he was, he wouldn't put himself through all the stress, get shot in the head, and all the other abuse that they throw at him. He'd still be enjoying his billions of dollars in his retired life. Good point. The other disturbing thing for me is Beyonce got more airtime than an attempted assassination of a former president. That is also a very good point. Beyonce getting a lot of coverage for not attending. The entire do as I say, not as I do stance of the Democrat Party is possibly the winner of the most disturbing thing to me. Thank you very much. Now, so 
someone had asked Ken, who has been our official correspondent all week, staying up late to watch the convention so we would not have to. Someone asked after the week, does he feel dirty? This is what Ken had responded to. To answer your viewer's question on if I feel dirty after watching the DNC, let's just say we are headed to the store shortly to get more soap. My water bill has skyrocketed in the last week, and my inpatient therapy is starting to today at noon. But I have to say, being a political analyst for the fastest-growing political political commentary show in America, frankly speaking, was worth it. Well, very kind of you, Ken. Thank you so much. Now we go to our interview. I'm sorry I had to read all those comments. Phil, thanks for joining us this morning. Good to be with you. So we've got a lot to cover about. First, sure. obviously, we have to talk about the flooding because I know you've been very hands-on with this. And what? how heartbreaking. It's, it's devastating. It's um, unbelievable. I mean, I felt bad. Well, obviously, I was uh, when it happened, I was actually out of state. I, we'd taken my mom down to North Carolina oh. to see her sister who celebrated her 90th birthday. Oh, wow. My mom's 84. She's 90. So that was nice. But yeah. when it hit on for the Friday, I mean... We were getting reports, and I started a text chain with the Senator Romero, his staff, my staff, uh, uh, um, Congressman Langworthy's office, Joe Giglio's office, with Joe Sempolinski and those guys, yeah. just to uh, make contact and say so we could start sharing some information. And the pictures and the videos, was I couldn't believe it. I mean, this just happened to that same location three years ago. Uh, you know, it with was, Fred, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. It was, it's funny because I was working for uh, Congressman Reed at the time, yeah. and I had the flashbacks to that exact, like you said, I remember you even then. We had text messages going on, everything, because it's just devastating for these communities and to think that they're going through this. The Jasper School. Oh, yeah. I went through there. I, I When I got back into town um, after being down there for the weekend, I had Tim Marshall, our Steuben County yeah. Emergency Management Director, reached out to him. He took me around, drove me around. Uh, to the areas that were impacted, I mean, just to see the like the debris up against the budding up, yeah. up against the bridges, uh, roads that were totally collapsed. Uh, I saw power lines, uh, telecommunications lines s- collapsed and submerged under our debris. I mean, it was just a house houses that were collapsed. Houses are no longer there in some yeah. places, and it's just. And, and I went through Jasper Troops for school again yeah. this time, just like I did uh, three years ago. It was devastating. And they're about to open up again after yes. all that. And uh, I know FEMA wanted them to build and repair back on that same site. I don't know if that will happen now. And I think, because they, they were trying to press, I know, to keep it off site, to move it to a different location. Yeah. And FEMA say, no, you gotta keep it here. I would hope, because they said you won't have repetitive incidences. Well, I hope this shows that it's, re- not, it's repetitive yeah. and it's not really a good idea to build there, but it was devastating. And to see that, the heartbreak, and you know, it's just, and uh, of course, uh, when, we were, when, when I was in North Carolina, um, Congressman Lane, because we were talking, yep. he he wanted to reach, uh, do a tour of the place, and he went there. I know Senator Romero was mm-hmm. there, Congressman, or some of them, Gilio, our staffs, so other people were there, the, the emergency management director, all those people were there looking and talking and seeing sites. Uh, I, I got that call like Saturday afternoon that yeah. they were going to try to do that, so I connected him with like Jack Wheeler, sure. uh, Tim Marshall, um, Eric Rose um, from DAPW, um, Commissioner of Public Works, sure. and then probably around 8 o'clock at night, I got a call from my chief of staff saying that the governor was coming to town. And, yeah, and she did a press conference up in Cannon Steel. I couldn't be there. Um, in the press conference, she wasn't there long. She was just in Cannon Steel. She didn't go to Jasper, Jasper Trusberg or Woodhall, which was also devastated three years yes. ago. And I think the thing that when I said to Tom O'Meara, I said, just remind her. And he, I didn't have to remind him. He knew. He knew. Yeah. Three years ago, um, unfortunately, Governor Hochul turned her back Mm-hmm. on these communities by not providing any direct assistance exactly. grants, um, especially to homeowners or businesses. And there was a precedent for doing that. It happened, um, I remember in Yates County when it happened in 2013, um, Lieutenant Governor Duffy showed up and said, if you're an individual homeowner, $10,000 businesses, $25,000. There was flooding on Lake Ontario, that devastating families and homeowners. You know, they provided grants of up to 50000 for them. And then... Three years ago, nothing. Nothing. Well, what happened is uh, we were pushing and pushing. They were trying to get FEMA assistance for those individual assistance. It didn't come through. We knew, we knew it wasn't because of the history of that program. Right. By the time they offered anything, it was seven months later, and the program wasn't reimbursable to folks. So no one was going to benefit from that program. We were so furious. I couldn't believe I remember. I was just angry. I know we've talked about it. Yeah. So like we said, to, you know, make sure we're telling the governor. Three years ago, you turned your back. You need mm-hmm. to come up. And, she, and I'll give her credit. She came here. Mm-hmm. We asked her to come three years ago. She didn't. I remember she went to a fundraiser here in the area, <laughs> but she didn't go. 
to those communities. But she did. And the fact that she was here, we appreciate it. Sent a positive message, a strong message that she was with us, her words. Mm -hmm. She made a lot of promises. Mm -hmm. And that was a good thing because we need, these people need help. These businesses need help. But then what came from that is uh, shortly thereafter, after she left, because she promised fifty thousand dollars yes. up to homeowners. Mm-hmm. After she left, the press con- press release went out and it said there was basically eligibility guidelines, and basically it was a, a, a income up to sixty thousand dollars. No one was going to benefit from that. No, no. an individual. What? Um, you know, if you got a family of four, it was like eighty thousand dollars. I mean, if you have two school teachers or two people working, you're gonna and you're gonna exceed those income guidelines. So your livelihood or your house or whatever is destroyed, and you're punished for making too much, which is a very right. low bar that they've set. And, and I absolutely. And just to give you that comparison, we said this in Lake Ontario flooding. Yep. I mean, you have Lake Shore homes. Yes. There's no income limits. And then if you were if it was your primary residence, yeah. But if it was your secondary residence. You they you were eligible for assistance if you made up to two hundred seventy five thousand dollars. So None where does that make sense? sense. And, and this you know the southern part of Steuben County is is is, 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 is it may not, a lot of Steuben County is a challenged rural area. Mm-hmm. So, but to think that they you, you shouldn't be any can come limit on it. Period. And so we pressed. I mean, there was I know one of the I think where the, the homeowner where the press conference was held and I, I visited her. So her side of her house house is totally collapsed in. Um, did a post. Um, I did an interview with when I was with Tim Marshall. The local media reached out to me, and I met them, and I talked about this issue. Saying I brought up about three years ago, saying this there should be no income limits on this. We need to move. No. And, and I, the, the the word I used that kept coming to mind with this is inclusion. Inclusion. How often do we hear Kathy Hochul, Joe Biden talk about inclusion? Inclusion. Mm-hmm. But this yeah. policy that they put out with their press release, their press release. Mm-hmm was exclusionary it would have eliminated families it would have eliminated individuals and group people who wouldn't have been benefited from this much needed grant program so we put that out there people you know we were calling i know senator marrow's calling we were making the case ultimately they changed their mind a few a day or so later mm-hmm. they said they were reevaluating the income and then they came up with this income of Hundred and fifty-seven thousand dollars. Why that number? Certainly, but hundred thousand. That's yeah. better than it was. Yeah, but what a random number. <laughs> what a random number. Well, I think they made it to fit for certain people, which is they yeah. needed to raise that threshold. Yeah. But quite frankly, we, and Tom said this to them. I said there shouldn't be an income limit. Period. No. Especially when you look at Lake Ontario, there was no income limit if it was your primary residence. Yeah. And if it was your secondary residence, up to two hundred seventy-five thousand. Yeah. Why aren't we using two hundred seventy-five thousand mm-hmm. dollars? We've told people apply. Mm-hmm. If you don't get it, uh, approved let us know we're gonna we're gonna continue to make the case because these people can't have their back turned on them no. a time this is t- th- two times in three years yes and i have a i there's something about it that i have an issue with when you give a press conference in front of a house when as she did that was destroyed and i don't know the specifics of that person but technically they could be excluded from this yes so you can use your destroyed home for the pr for the picture and then yeah. sorry you're, well, you're I'm, out of this. i'm not i'm, I'm 99 point search so, so sure yeah um she was one of the people that made the post saying yeah. i'm going to be excluded from this yeah and they i think they panicked and all we realized what oh, they yeah. did it you went viral come, it whatever. did yeah, yeah. yeah. see i'm not I as know, big on social media I know, some but people no, are people but, were talking about yeah, it a lot well, it's just, it shouldn't have been any income no. moments and that's why when we were i was with tim marshall going around i got a call from the wny reporter and he got yeah. a call at the same time so we circled back he gave update and i talked about this that this is a problem this is something we're going to fight for fight against because it can't happen so we're glad we raised the threshold it was better than it was mm-hmm. but no one should be excluded from this and i'm just concerned there are going to be families because you could have two school teachers working yeah. who would be excluded from this program uh based on their income i mean you could have two uh, uh manufacturing workers excluded from this program um because of their income if you have you know, two people in a household or three people, whatever it might be. It's just not, not. And, and when you talk about that kind of number for a second home, mm. now I'm not knocking anybody that has a second home on the lake. That's great for them. Yeah. But what about the person who's only home and they're, you know, exactly. it, it doesn't even, it doesn't make sense. And it's so wrong headed to do it that way. I don't even understand why they would. I don't From I don't a PR know. standpoint, I, if nothing I, else. I, I have, I really, I can't rationale the, yeah. the, the reason behind no. that, why they came out with this number, why they use this number, why it was part. And they said, well, that was just part of our press release. Well, yeah, it was your, your press release, not ours. Yeah, yeah. And she had the ability to change and thank God she did. Yeah. But it should be no limit period, but we'll see it. We'll track it and keep an eye on it. 
Um, but beyond that, I just want to say thank you um, to the to the volunteers, the not for profit agencies, organizations, the United Way, all those who the Red Cross, all those who have come in mm -hmm. to provide assistance. I saw uh, I one, where one farmers took hay to another farmers. Yeah, you know, oh, wasn't that great? I yes, saw that video. And, uh, I mean, it's just that's our community. That's how resilient and strong our community is. I mean, we look out for each other. We look out for our neighbors in time of need, in time of disaster. That's what happened three years ago. That's what's mm -hmm. happening now today. Uh, it's just nice that finally the state government is coming through and providing help to provide some direct assistance to those who are eligible and meet this income threshold. Uh, again, it shouldn't be anybody, but we should be also, in my opinion, um, providing grants to businesses who are devastated I was going to ask, this. is there, a, there's nothing? Um, not the direct grant assistance as she proposed. We think that should be changed too, because that was provided before. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think what they're going to, you know, they're going through the federal disaster declaration. I think they're, I think you need $37 million. Yeah. I think we should, I think we're going to hit that in Stubant alone. So. Yeah. I mean, with the damage, to, that doesn't even, I, when I was talking to Tim Marsh at one point, they were like, after day one, like twenty million, and that didn't even include the school. Yeah. So, I think we'll hopefully get to that. But you got to document it. You got to make sure you're showing what the losses are, so we can put that, and then we can help to repair the infrastructure. Because the FEMA money, well, what that comes in, they'll they'll cover, um, the you know the local infrastructure costs at seventy five percent. That's the other thing we got to push back on. This is make sure that they're picking the state is picking up the local share. Yeah. Because there will be a local share to this. So usually it's federal government seventy five percent, then it's twenty five split between the federal and local government. Yeah. The local government can't can't impact can't take this on, so we got to make sure that. And they did pick up the local share last time on the infrastructure, where they turned their back was on, on the individual assistance. So hopefully we can get both of those addressed this year, and we should be doing the, the businesses. I think, as it stands now, you might be having to look at, SBA emergency loans. They don't need loans; no. they need grants. Exactly. And it's just it's just mind blowing to me, and, uh, and that's just one part of it. And, and the other part that kind of comes up along with this issue on the flooding. Um, is the debris removal? Yeah, I want to talk about. That. I got to take yeah. a break, but I sure. want to talk about that because I think that's something that's overlooked. And yes, and but I, let me take a break so we can get really into it. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking. And we are back with Frankly Speaking, broadcasting live from the Hesselsons Studio here on Market Street and Corning. This is the Stu Benton Senior Services Fund section of our program, and we are being joined by Assemblyman Phil Palmasano. Thanks again for being on the show, Phil. We're talking about the flooding. You know, and I've heard a lot of people criticize not criticize but what's happening with the jasper school that you know think of the cost there right okay. so much money they were about to open you feel heartbreaking for them that they can't open and these kids were going to have their school back and a lot of it boils down to why is this repeating itself why is nothing being done potentially year round to make sure or you know army corps of engineers whoever gets involved with this to fix so that this doesn't keep happening right and this is a good question i will say like after going through the Jasper Troopers for school yeah. for the second time in three years, I've yeah. seen the devastation. I know when they were talking about, and de they had to deal with FEMA, and they, they've been dealing with FEMA for years on this. And I mean, I was on call with them and FEMA yeah. at one point just trying to make sure the connection was going. FEMA was insisting that they rebuild at that site, repair that building, and that's what they were they, they had to do. But one of the reasons they wouldn't look at a new location is because FEMA was saying, well, you haven't had repeat incidences. Well, they have now. So yeah. now they have, hopefully they reevaluate this and let them go look at a different site. So there's things they can do in different sites they can look at that are not right behind the creek. Right. Um, so, and you mentioned, I mean, one of the biggest things, I know we touched it briefly, um, and I know the, the the local newspaper did a really good article on it, uh, mm -hmm. talking about the debris removal. Yeah. Um, in the times of an emergency, um, they will declare these uh, emergency things, things where you can get in these streams and creeks. Right. Uh, which they did um, after we were complaining about you know the process because it takes a hard it's a hard time. Oh, it sure. takes a long time to get a permit, and they always look at it. How are you going to influence uh, <laughs> the aqua life or the, the trout or the salmon or whatever muscle. it may be? Yeah. But my goodness, I mean, after especially after touring the sites um, with Tim Marshall, going in and looking at these creeks and streams and rivers, yeah. I mean, the amount of debris was ungodly. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, literally like tree logs yeah. up abutting, abutting against the bridges, and that's what happened. They get caught on the bridges and the, the, like the a natural the, dam essentially, uh, or the or a culvert. Yeah, yeah, it's like a natural dam, and that's why it happened. So we have to allow. The, the, our local agencies, our local governments, our yeah. local people, even homeowners, to be able to get in the stream, to, in rivers and creeks, to do stuff around their properties and be a collaboration. Um, 
we need to focus on the people before we focus on the salamander. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, there's a always, process. And, you know, you want people say, well, you're exaggerating. We're not exaggerating. No, it's always we're not. it's almost absurd when you ever hear the excuse that it's yeah. some type of muscle. Well, muscles are going to be here long after we're gone right. and we're here long before and we're here. I will say, here. too, when we were driving around, I was driving with Tim because there was a state. They're, they're, they're in there with the with their you know, equipment yeah. going through the river and stream, you know, full blown. Yeah. But why can't, why we have to, you know, go over, uh, jump over, uh, you know, bridges and just to do it. I know. And I know uh, certainly um, um, Jeff Parker from Stuben Soil and Water does a fantastic job mm -hmm. uh, dealing with permits and helping to get into these creeks and doing stream bank stabilization and helping with flooding issues. And, and it, his hands are tied so often. But, you know, with this emergency, this helps a little bit. But we need a better long-term solution. We need, a, we need a partnership and a collaboration with the DC. We can't just say, no, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, if we can't get this debris out, and if we can't have yep. a process in doing mitigation, stream bank stabilization, because you know, stream banks were you know decimated, the debris is still in there. It's, there's, there was debris in there still from the, the flood yeah. three years ago. Yeah. So we need to get in there. Otherwise, you're, you're going to have this is going to repeat itself over and over and over again. I don't know whether the thing is like a dog chasing his tail. Yeah. Definition of insanity is doing the same thing over exactly. and over again. That's what we're doing. We can't have this happen again. At cost of lives, livelihoods, yes. taxpayer dollars over and over again. And yeah. just because they want to look the other way. Right. I mean, the DC is quick to say climate change. We just all have to climate change. But they're not, not helpful on their end at yeah. all to help with things at, at all. All right, we got a comment from a viewer. Before we go to break, because we're going to take a break, and I, I'm going to ask you about the DNC, because sure. I know you watched it patiently every day. Yeah. Couldn't wait. But here's a comment from a viewer. Good morning, Frank, and good morning to Phil, and thank you for your efforts for the people, Phil. Isn't that nice? All right, we'll be right back with Frankly Speaking. Stay with us. And we are back broadcasting live from the Hasselson studio. This is a Stuben Senior Services Fund section of our program because we're being joined by Assemblyman Phil Pomisano. You know, Phil, yesterday we had on, um, well, I think it was yesterday, doesn't matter, uh, Don Berlue from Watkins Glen International. Do you know, speaking of the flooding, they're offering discounts for NYSEG employees. I thought that was a great idea because they've been very important this whole summer, it seems like. Yes, I mean, that's just another reminder. I mean, what a team collaborative approach. Oh, I mean, yeah. People, this community, whether it's businesses, individuals families looking out for each other and so i just want to give another big shout out and thank you yeah. to all the agencies organizations the employees the volunteers that helped mm -hmm. look out for your neighbors and were there to provide assistance to each other again i keep going back to the picture i saw the farmers providing all that yeah, that was so nice i mean it's just yeah that's the it's type community. of community we live yeah. in and that's the resiliency of this community we're going to bounce back we always do but it's going to take some time and you know this collaboration is partnership so it's, it's great that wgi is doing that and recognizing with the, our nice employees and others and so this is just we have to say thank you to all of you so thank you yes absolutely now we've got to talk about we were from dec to dnc oh my lord <laughs> that was corny oh uh, so have you been watching what do you, what do you think we've had uh correspondence uh, on the ground practically uh, uh writing in every day ken and others mm -hmm. about what they saw we had our governor give arguably the biggest speech of her life yeah, i've heard it I, I'll be honest. I didn't watch much. I saw some <laughs> clips because I like to look at the, the commentary yeah. afterward. Um, I will say when you said Ken said about washing up, yeah. <laughs> I've used that reference coming back from all. I mean, I said because it weighs some of the policies. I, oh, I yeah. kind of read references to people like, you know, when I'm driving back from Albany, the, the further away from Albany I get, the closer to home I get. Yeah. The cleaner I feel. I'm sure. <laughs> so I can recognize where, you know, what Ken was coming from. from. Absolutely. But, but yeah, so I, I didn't watch. I mean, uh, we know some of the policies that she's she's tied yeah. to that she's been advocating. I, I, I want to see her do interviews. I want to see her asking can, questions, answer questions from the press about her policies. Do you about realize her, right now, as responsibility. of right this second, you've given more interviews with the media than the presidential nominee for the Democrat Party? It's amazing, isn't it? Right? I mean, yeah. the she's fact that the media allows this, as a member of the media, you get paid to do a job of interviewing people, the people in power, and and the media seems fine it's with like, it. It's like I mean, you go to those other media, like whether well, CNN and MSNBC, yeah. they're like all giddy. They're like they protect her. Yeah, just like they protected yeah. Joe Biden for the past three years. They were an accomplice uh, to uh, the, the biggest cover up in history. Of uh, his, you know, if yeah. they didn't have that debate, this wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and Kamala, Kamala Harris was a, a, a partner to this conspiracy yes, and cover course. up on this as well. It's terrible. But we know more about her, the impact of her policies on inflation and tax policies and price control policies. That she's having. We know the impact of her criminal justice policies. We know the impact of the uh, the bail the bail bail reform policies around this country that she supported and advocated for. Donate to this to release these people who are t- burning down the cities after the. Uh, George Floyd. Yeah. I mean, it's terrible. And we certainly know the immigration and border crisis that we're having and the sanctuary city and state issue we're going on. And what I've said about this really is I spoke about this. Um, I was at a recent um, function. And I, what we're seeing is really a merger of bad and dangerous policies from D- Washington, D.C. and Albany. Yes. Democrats. That's what I, I want to so say. All, I don't want to say all Democrats because when you talk to common sense Democrats, even some around here, obviously, oh, yeah. when you talk about immigration, they want the border secure. <laughs> when you talk about bail reform, they want you know dangerous people to be in prison. Uh, so you're having this perfect merger of uh, well, a devastating merger, but it's a yeah. it's like a perfect storm. Yes, uh, of the immigration policy, the border policy, the bail bail reform, and I'll give you a perfect example to go full circle. There was a Venezuelan illegal immigrant yes. who crossed the border, mm-hmm. was talked to by yeah. by ICE or whoever, right. and released. Mm-hmm. He said, come back in future. This individual went to New York, mm-hmm. committed a crime in New York be- because... Yeah. Th- there was the no, bail reform... There was no they, they just There was no repercussion. They let the person go. Mm-hmm. They should have... And because... New York is in New York City is a sanctuary city, and yes. basically New York State is a sanctuary state because Governor Cuomo did an executive order saying yeah. that law enforcement, local law enforcement, can't cooperate with federal ICE officials mm-hmm. relative to illegal immigrants and crimes they commit, which is ridiculous. If an illegal immigrant commits a crime, they should be going back and being deported right away, instantly. So this person, yeah, this Venezuelan individual, came, got released, came to New York, committed a crime, got released, went back to Georgia. And killed twenty year old Lake and Riley. Yeah. It's unacceptable. This is and, and this is the policy it. of this administration. This is the policy of this administration. This is this is what this is what Kamal Harris, our border czar, mm-hmm. was in charge of. This happened under her watch, under right. Joe Biden's watch, and they own this. Yeah. You see stories about illegal immigrants raping twelve year old kids it's or attacking read them. the New York Post. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's happening time and time again. I mean I know everyone criticized Donald Trump in two thousand sixteen when he said you know these bad people these they said they painted a brush. We're not talking about I mean, we're talking about no. these people that are committing crimes that are getting documented. released from prison. It's documented. Yeah. And now here the these crimes people, are documented. <laughs> yes. And and it's just mind blowing yeah. to me how this can just go on and on again in this immigration policy. Now you see Individuals with terrorist links being caught, yes. who were released, Isn't and then they had terrifying? to go back out and chase them. Mm-hmm. They, they don't know where these people. And we're talking about some 10, 12, 15, 20 million illegal immigrants because they don't know. They can't account for the get, the getaways. No, just the people they've documented. And this is taking its toll on communities. It's obviously it's costing New York City. It's costing other communities around the country. But it's, it's public safety. Mm-hmm. It's you know the economy. You know they're getting you know. Money to, in New York City, they're getting what is it? I, they get like a debit card, like five hundred dollars a month yeah. or something, just to, for. I mean, that's taxpayer money. Yeah. I mean, we just gave away it's not free. Um, well, they gave away, uh, as part of the budget, yeah. two point four billion to help illegal immigrants. Yeah, on top of the one point nine billion from before. Yeah, over four billion dollars, but yet we have to we have to beg <laughs> and say help these flood victims, victims. who are citizens. Yeah. What is going on with this state? What is going on with this country? And that's why it's appropriate that Hochul spoke at the DNC. When you think about it, they're yeah. the same similar failed policies. They are. And she's, it's ridiculous. I mean, so I'm glad she came here. She had to, she had promises. She made tremendous promises. It's easy to say her and do a press conference <laughs> to make promises. That's what's so frustrating. And, and the pushback and, you know, with social media came back quick. So she made adjustments, but not far enough. And we should be providing assistance to business. I know we're going back to that, but yeah. that's. The policies Policy. that we've seen. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't want to paint all Democrats with one broad brush, but the Democratic well, agenda, leadership in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. that are making decisions, the Democratic leadership in Albany mm-hmm. that are making decisions, one party rule, right. is creating these uh, crime policies that basically tip the scales of justice in favor of criminals over public safety, mm-hmm. over crime victims and their families, and certainly over our law enforcement. You see the people getting a 
you know, our law enforcement in jeopardy. You see our corrections officers inside yeah. our correctional facilities being attacked. The issue with fentanyl up in Collins Correctional Facility. People, you know, were exposed that could have died. Mm-hmm. And they're getting assaulted and attacked on a daily basis and because they can't isolate and segregate the most dangerous and violent inmates from the rest of the general population. Right. Not only just keeping themselves safe, but keeping other inmates safe that are trying to just do their time. You have these very violent... So just, it's these criminal justice policies over and over yeah. again and i just but their answer is to close down prisons yeah. and that's and one of the reasons they were closing down is because they said there's staff shortages but you don't we have staff shortages in our nursing homes and our hospitals the that's answer is not to um close down nursing close homes down. and hospitals you provide recruitment bonuses you provide retention mm-hmm. bonuses you provide better pay and benefits that's what we need to do if we want to um, bring more people into our corrections uh um profession and it is a profession yes. um and Unfortunately, the public has no idea. They drive by Elmira Correctional Facility and see the, that, that prison up on the hill. They don't want to know what's going on in there. They don't know how bad it is in there. They just know they want the people in there to stay behind bars. But, of course, this administration, just like the previous administration, is act, enacting policies to help them get out of prison earlier through parole reform. We see cop killers being released in parole. So whether it's bail reform, raise the age, parole reform, all these issues, you know, they want elder parole, which would basically allow someone – um, who who's 55 and served 15 years of their sentence to be able to come up for parole right. after those 15 years. So for, God forbid you committed murder, or brutally murder and raped a child, and were sentenced 30 years to life in prison. If you're 40, when you're 40, you don't have to serve 15 years and then be up for parole. And the advocates say, well, that doesn't mean they're going to get out. But what you do is you put those families through that yeah. whore every two years mm-hmm. because that's the maximum time between parole hearings. Right. The Roby family went through that time and time, time again, again and had to relive that tragedy over and over again and ultimately the murderer was released i yeah. mean what is going on with our parole board i mean we have we have someone on the parole board who's actually murdered married not murdered excuse me has actually married to a convicted murderer so they got that perspective but when we had legislation to allow crime victims and law enforcement on the parole board um, the, the, the one party control and Democrats in assembly uh, rejected that. Yeah, we got to take a short break. Touch. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking. I'm talking about okay. And we are back with Frankly Speaking, broadcasting live from the Hasselson studio. This is the Stu Ben Senior Services Fund section of our program. And Phil, we were talking about uh, the DNC. And I know, let's face it, that's a lot of fun to watch, right? The Trump, Harris, and what's going on. But there are so many important races locally, too. And I don't want people, I bring it up maybe arguably too much on the program, I don't want people to forget how important the local votes are. Because they, as we've been talking about with the flooding, it affects your day-to-day life more so than even a, a Harris or a Trump. Yes, and, and yes, obviously the presidential race is very important. Exactly. We need to get out and vote. Um, and, but you got to go up and down the ticket and look at the impact of those. Yes. Uh, elections matters. I've said this over and again. Elections have consequences. Mm-hmm. And if you don't vote and you don't participate, that's problematic. And, yes. uh, and, and basically you reap what you sow. So we need our people to get out there and vote. I mean, I can go down you know, the ballot. I mean, um, certainly at the U.S. Senate, Mike Sapricone. I've seen, I've yeah. been traveling around. I was out in Allegheny and Cattaraugus County, or Cattaraugus and Chautauqua County last week um, honoring my colleagues, uh, Joe Giglio and uh, Andy yeah. Goodell, yeah. and Mike Sapricone was there. He's great. Um, he he you gave have, us a full hour on the program and stopped in. What, it was nice to learn about him. He, he would make a great senator. Yes. Uh, yep. And so many people echoed that statement when they were writing in when he was on the show. I also mentioned Michael Henry. He's yep. running for attorney general against Tish James. I mean, Tish James is a terrible attorney general. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ran against her three year, four years ago. Mm-hmm. He lost, but he had 47% of the vote. Yeah. He was just as close as Zeldin was. Yeah. So he's out there already, Good. which we need people out there early in some of these races to make the. He's out there. He was in El, El Cattaraugus County. He was in Chautauqua County. He's around. He's he's yeah. he's making the rounds. And I've seen him. At, he was at the Scope event in in Yates oh, County oh, Saturday. Uh, so they're yeah. out and about. So from a, from a uh, you know statewide perspective, they're they're important. But you know, if I just kind of go down the line, no, please do. Certainly, uh, Nick Laneworthy, doing a great my job. great friend. I've known I've known Nick. I've told people uh, since 2004 when I was oh. a district director for, for Congressman Randy Cool. He oh, yeah. was a district director for, for Tom Reynolds, and I tell people Nick was looking out for me way back then, just like he looked out for us as uh, the state party chair, and like he's looking out yeah. for us every day as our congressman. Uh, we go to fo- events, and you, you know a lot of people use their cameras now or video their their phones. Yeah, yeah. We had cameras. Yeah. 
And so uh, there's times we go up to the Rochester area where we'd overlap, and I'd forget my camera, and he'd take pictures for me, looking out for me, send it to me, so I could wouldn't get in trouble with the the (laughs) congressman. So, but he's doing a great job. He's been here. He's talking to people. Uh, I've seen him. He was like when we were making the connection about the flood he goes i want to come down there i gotta get in touch who else can we get in touch with asking who else we can talk to so he was talking reaching out he's engaged he's a fighter um i've known him for a long time and i just want you all know if you haven't met uh congressman Langworthy, you have a true fighter in front of him as our representative in washington dc he's fighting hard to make sure your voice is heard and he knows how important this area is to him uh, this area is the one to put him over to the top in his primary, oh, yeah. and, and he he likes to get here as much as possible. He's a great uh, local office here in Corning. Sharon Murphy does a great job for him. I give a shout out to Sharon. Yeah. I see her. She's watching. She's 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 at all these events yeah. covering from him. I was with her last night at a, a local event, so she does a great job on you know on the constituent service and representing him here. But they got a great team, and we work with them. And it is a team atmosphere. We work closely. Uh, Congressman Langworthy, Senator Tom O'Mara, who I'll pivot to now, and, yep. and my all my colleagues at the state. It's a team atmosphere, and we work together. Uh, so Nick is a great job; does a great job, great team fighting and advocating for us in Washington D.C. So you know, kind of. And what can I say about Tom O'Mara? I've uh, worked closely with him since uh, we both were elected. I was elected to the Assembly in 2010. He was the Senate. We've been close. We we became really close friends, but we're good close partners in government we talk all the time mm-hmm. about the issues that are impacting people here in our in, in our areas that we overlap and like i said we were talking about the flooding issue we're on the phone oh, yeah. texting each other and talking and this is not just on this on every issue whether you're talking about go back to local infrastructure or our energy policy we talk about it all the time so so he's doing a great job and i i tell tom's the the ranker on the senate finance committee so he has to sit through tens of hours of budget hearings and he's he does a tremendous job he he's does. got a, he does a great column every week i wish i did columns like he did and I, I could do a better job but he touches on the issues that people care about so i tell you there's really no stronger fighter in albany than tom O'Mara. so he's a good friend but um you know for the listeners or the viewers out there you have a great advocate as our state center in tom O'Mara. yeah and you were mentioning that you were at Gilio's uh, again yes. at a retirement yeah oh, i heard it was a blast J- yeah it was nice time uh, joe Gilio. i can't i I can't say no. He was he. I met Joe when I was a staffer for Randy Cool when he was elected in two thousand five. He um, good guy. I got to know him. Then I was away when I was working for Senator Winter for a while. When, when I went to Albany, he came right up to me and took me under his wing. He became my mentor up there. He looked out for me. Oh, yeah. and, and I tell people, was just my mentor. He was my big brother. Yeah. And I and I, and I told Joe Sampolinski because I know who's running for a seat, which I'll talk about Joe in a minute. Nothing is Joe, but I didn't I didn't want. <laughs> Joe Julio to leave, yeah, <laughs> because he I felt better yeah. with him there. I he was someone I could trust and confide in, who was helpful to me. Just a great, great guy. A, a, a decorated career in, in service of both at the local level and law enforcement and in, in the assembly. He was he's really had the respect. He was like really I would say he's the heart and soul of our conference. Uh, didn't debate a lot, but when he spoke, you knew. Oh, yeah. And he had to respect the people on both sides of the aisle. He will be greatly missed. They were going to miss Mer- Burns. Yes, and Marge Burns. What a great friend she became for me, and we talked all the time. She knew. She was always so kind with me. She knew yeah. when she walked in, she had my hometown of Hornell. Yeah. And I go, Marge, I'm going to come around here a little bit. <laughs> she goes, no, you come anytime you want. <laughs> and, so, and it was great. And I was sad to see her. She, she came with such a immediately a strong voice strong advocate on behalf of common sense conservative issues mm-hmm. and she's just a strong i'm gonna miss her she's yep. she's a great friend i wish her the very best uh she deserves this mm-hmm. her and joel both don't just deserve it they've earned it oh yeah and uh so i'm gonna miss both of them but we have good people out there right now um now joel semplinski yeah. of course you see you, you know the viewers see joel our former yeah. congressman yeah and we, you know, he, <laughs> the weirdest trajectory in history. Yes, but you know, uh, just all over the place. He's, I knew when that he made that train. He, he and I, I say we don't give Joe Semblinski enough credit yeah. because he, uh, he stepped in when no one else wanted to just do a four month term. He goes, I would do it. We need to do it because we need to have a voice and watch the over and those four. He didn't just sit there in a seat. No, he didn't. He he made significant <laughs> impact. Had laws passed. That's the type of guy I Joe worked is. For him. I didn't want to I know work that did. hard. I, I wanted know. him to take it easy. Yeah, but that's the type of guy <laughs> yeah, Joe Sempelinski is. is. Yeah. I mean, and I'm just excited to have him. You know, he's too. got a race. We got to get out and vote. And yeah. he has the, the the southwestern part of the part of this, mm-hmm. Canisteo, um, Hartsville, Jasper, Tusser, Greenwood, and yeah. um, to, West yeah. and Union. Yeah, oh, yeah, Union. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, and then um, 
in the northern part where Marge happened, uh, she's, she has Dansville, uh, Cohocton, Whalen, Prattsburg. Mm-hmm. And now, uh, now she has uh, with the new election. I had them. I have them till the end of the year. Avoca and Wheeler. Okay. Um, and I picked up Hornell, which of course yeah, I wanted. Excited about and Hornell, so yeah, I'm a little yeah. excited. <laughs> but uh, the the fact of the matter is, Steuben County has three members of the assembly. And I say Hornell still has three advocates for the yeah. some. Cohocton, Whalen, we we all work together. We're oh, all yeah. going to advocate for them. So I've had all of Steuben County when I first came in the first two years and I got split up. So you represent part of the county, you represent the whole county. Yes. So I say the same thing with Seneca County that I represent and in, in Shimon County, which I represent. I have parts of those counties. We work together with our colleagues there. And then I also represent all of Gates and Schuyler County. So uh, Joe's going to do a great job. And Andrea Valley, uh, yep. she's doing a great job. She's she's our Livingston County uh, county clerk. Well-known, well-respected, mm-hmm. well-liked. She's out there um, busting the trail and yeah. she's going to do a great job she's going to make a great addition to the new york city assembly i'm looking forward to having her with us as well and then we even have uh and this is we talked to joe about this last time because this is relatively new on our radars which is the steuben county uh, judge race yes. because with a retirement without getting into all the wonkiness of politics it kind of many people were caught off guard not knowing what's going on so we have a race there that's going to be a contested race yes it is i mean it's, it, this is the first time really i mean we've had primaries mm-hmm. Um, this is going to be a, a Democrat versus Republican, and regardless of the DRR, yeah, I just want to talk about Matt McCarthy. Mm-hmm. He happens to be the Republican candidate. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. I'm not, sure. not going to hide that. No. but I've known Matt for over 20 years. Yeah. He was a graduate of St. Bonaventure, just like I was. Yeah, um, Matt is a worker. Matt gets it. He's a, he's a doer, and he understands the system. He's a judge. He was elected. To, Corning City judge back I think it was 2013 2014 yeah. 2013 because it was a 10, 10 year term yeah and he was supposed to run for that and then this all happened so now he's running for the the Steuben County and family court judge he's been doing the job already he's yeah. already acting he understands the law he understands it in, in these races when we talk about our judges these are these judicial races are just as important they are we need people we see what's happening with like in albany with the court of appeals and these judicial cases that just basically sides with the democrat we see we need people on the bench that understand and respect the constitution and will interpret the law not try to make law from the bench matt mccarthy is the type of judge we want and need mm-hmm. here in steuben county he gets it he understands he will he will interpret the law he will follow the Constitution and yep. make sure our Constitution rights and freedoms, things that come before us in the court, he will follow. And he's he's dedicated and committed. And I just want you to know, you, you, you will not go wrong with Matt McCarthy as our next Steuben County and Family Court judge. He's a good guy and will work really, really hard for us. Phil, we, it's hard to believe we are out of time. So what I want to say is, can we have you on soon to talk about energy? Because I want this oh my. is my fault. I talked about everything else, but we got to talk about energy policy, okay? Yes, there's a lot we'll, to talk about. That. And I'll keep you up there on that. And as I said, we'll have both of the candidates for judge in Steuben County on the program soon. A thank you to all of our guests, of course, Assemblyman Phil Pomisano and Ellis Williams and Heather Haskin from Elmira the Little Theater, who was on earlier. Have a great weekend, everyone. Best of luck for everybody who's playing in the Sheriff's Golf Tournament today. Have fun. And we'll be back Monday morning with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV. Big Fox, I look forward to it already.